Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to be looking at the Marantz PM 7000 series. So overall specification for this amplifier power output in classic AB mode would be 95 watts RMS per channel into 8 ohm speakers. It does support uh, two sets of speakers so selectable uh, from the front fascia. You can also defeat the tone controls by selecting source direct Frequency response is 10 Hz to 50 kHz. Uh, total harmonic distortion 0.03%. It does have the facility to connect a turntable, and this uses a moving magnet type cartridge, and input there is 2.5 millivolts. And then for all of the other line inputs, it's 150 millivolts. And dimensions wise, 440 millimeters by 159 by, 3, uh, by 370, sorry. And then weight is quite hefty, so it's a 12.3 kilogram amplifier. Now, there's also a PM7200, uh, which I've done a repair tutorial for. Really, when you look from the front fascia, initially these amplifiers look the same, but it doesn't have on the 7000 the ability to select class A mode. So this is only supporting single mode operation then. And you see that from the circuit boards. Even the, the main amplifier board if you look from the top what you'll find is that the key components to actually operate the amp in a class a mode and also the presets to adjust the bias are just not on the board at all and then the same also for the power supply when you look at the large power supply board if you look from the face on the left hand side what you'll see there is normally there is a power relay associated components and then when you select class a mode you can hear the relay energize as it comes into operation then. Now the issue with this amplifier when it came in is not uncommon. So what the customer was reporting was that there was an intermittent loss of audio and that's that you know that that, that is common. It's not something which you know as a repair engineer for audio amplifiers you don't see on quite a regular basis I would say. And then when you actually look at the amplifier circuit design and what I've done is I've done a number of extracts from the service manual and we sort of get to those in a little while and uh, we can run through those then. But what I've detailed here is just really the whole repair sequence. So because the issue with the amplifier is due to the switching relays, which are the speaker protection relays, what you have to do is not just to replace the relays. They are sealed. You could try and open them up, but it's probably going to be difficult. And then commonly you also find that the contacts are um, heavily oxidized and sometimes you'll find that the switching contacts are pitted. So rather than just repair the specific fault, and I always use this word to provide longevity to the repair, really what you want to do here is adopt you know, a systematic approach to the fault finding. Now during the initial test I was just confirming that yes indeed it did have intermittent loss of sound. But what you could find as well is that if you kind of tapped the amplifier or just kind of moved it a little bit, then it would just trip into protection mode. And again, this is a telltale symptom for many amplifiers which develop dry joints over time. And the 7200 and the 7000 commonly, because this range of amplifiers made by Marantz, I wouldn't say it was kind of plagued with dry joints, but it did have a lot. So what we're saying here is, yeah, you can go off and repair the fault but you need to do a lot of remedial work just to prevent any issue in the future. So what I would do here is when you look from the underneath part of the amplifier, there is a service plate. And for people who are unfamiliar with this, what you can do is you can snip off the metal tabs, remove the plate, get access to the circuit or solder side of the amp board, but you don't get full access and that's an issue. And then if you had to put the service plate back on, of course you can't rejoin the tabs which you snipped off and you have to fix screws there and put it back in place. Thankfully this amplifier didn't have that service plate removed so that indicated to me someone hadn't sort of gone in there. They could have gone in from the top but they hadn't but no one had gone in from underneath which is good right you're only repairing a fault that has occurred rather than you're trying to fix the original fault after you've rectified maybe other work which has been carried out and resulted in some other issues then. So straightforward enough so once you got the front or the top cover plate off, just clean out any dust or residue, you know, just use a stiff long, long 
head brush and then maybe some compressed air and you can get all of that sort of dust layer out this amplifier was not too bad and then when you look from the back of the amplifier you've got to remove that back panel and there are a lot of screws because you know there's a lot of sort of um, different inputs on the amplifier so just remove all of those screws and then also be aware that when you reassemble the amplifier for testing on the rear speaker terminals where you have the fixing screws you'll see that the paint is not present and that's that's correct right and you see this on a lot of amplifiers they use like a grounding internal contact on the speaker terminal so when you put a screw through there it goes into the open contact you don't see it it's embedded into the plastic terminal itself and then that connects then to the ground on the board and then through the metal chassis and then when you when you screw on the back plate that makes that electrical connection so the reason why I'm telling you that is if you carry out any repair work on the amplifier and you're going to go test it, just make sure that back panel is on. And you don't have to put all the screws in, just make sure the speaker screws, speaker terminal screws are there. And then screw maybe one or two so the plate is secured to the rest of the chassis. If you don't do that, then you're going to lead to a catastrophic failure and that's going to be you know expensive. And then what I do here is I just work from left to right. So you can see again shown you have the input selection board and the nice thing with this amp because it's it's sort of high-end one it's using these precision relays to select the appropriate inputs and um, what i do is i'm just checking the rca input sockets and often you'll find dry joints on them and then also the interwiring cables as well so just look over that board and reflow all of the different connections and then for me i just move it to one side clean it off you know more closely with a brush make sure everything is okay i'm doing a visual inspection of the board as well i'll then put that then to one side and then the next part is to remove like the power amplifier stage and i've said this on the 7200 amp repair it's modular so it's really easy to work on so once you remove the fixing screws you can you can just unplug it from the power supply and the interconnections and just lift that module out i can put the main amp chassis to one side and then I can work on it and I can show you in or I'll show you in the video where I'll remove the protection board because that just plugs in and I'm showing again the solder side and non-solder side and you'll always find dry joints on there I'm just doing a visual inspection you don't tend to have issues with bad capacitors on these amps unlike the NAD you know where they're using these these um, JH capacitors they're high quality capacitors that have gone in there and the overall board design is good inside the uh, the the amplifier then and then what i also do is i'm scouring the main amp board for any dry joints right and you will find multiple dry joints where you have heat on some of the power components but also maybe they have some degree of mechanical stress so just work your way through and what i, I would say as well you know just take your time when you do that and don't get distracted if you're working on it and you're going to get distracted you may accidentally form make maybe like a solder bridge and then you're not seeing it and then you come back and then you know you try and test it and you've got an even bigger issue so just take the time ensure each one of those solder reflowed solder joints is good high quality solder in this case 6040 so uh, not non lead free so this is a lead based solder and if you need to just clean it off with some form of flux remover what I also do as well, you have the bias trimmers on there. So the bias trimmers, and there's twofold, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, but basically you can set the DC offset for each channel, and then you can also set the bias for each channel, but that comes to the final alignment. And then once I've done all of that work on the main amp module, I then concentrate on the power supply. And I show this, so you can see the very, very large, powerful electrolytic smoothing capacitors. And again, I'm looking for anywhere where I have mechanical stress, or heavy components or heat related components and I'm reflowing all of those solder joints and everything was really really good on that board no kind of issues or anything like that and then once I've done that it's a straightforward task of removing the fixing screws from the chassis which hold the front fascia in place and I can just unclip it there's just some side clips I, I can unclip it and I'll show this and what I'm first concentrating on is the volume control circuit board it plugs directly into the tone board and again there's going to be dry joints and you find them just reflow them also check that volume control circuit board and then i look towards the smaller boards where you have the input selection board 
So again, it's like an encoder and then I can just reflow. And then I also look at the headphone socket, very, very important. You'll often find dry joints on there. And then finally, where you have the bass treble control and balance controls, I have a look there as well. And for this amplifier, I did find a number of dry joints. All right. And what you've got to do is you've got to kind of re return the amplifier to a known good state. So here, the major issue for this amp is dry joints so we we take care of that it's not common on this amplifier that you have bad capacitors so i'm not sort of over emphasizing i can do some checking with an asr meter but it doesn't flag anything up if maybe i was working say on a nad c320 or maybe 3 uh, 370 i know from experience that there will always be bad capacitors and i do get a number of amplifier related questions where people are trying to fault find these these amps now, if you try and repair just a specific fault, you, you're not in a good place because you know from experience and historically these capacitors will always be bad in these amplifiers, right? So you've got to just block change them out, okay? If it was maybe a brand or a model where you didn't really have any issues capacitors, then that's a different thing and maybe, you know, you could just be dry solder joints. But don't attempt the repair, work on the base. I'm just going to fix that specific uh, fault if indeed there is history associated with you know other bad components then and then what i'm showing uh, um, next is really the alignment of the amplifier so when you look at the amplifier circuit board what i've done is i've put two additional um, parts of the service manual and it shows them there graphically so the first one that i'm just going to look at now is the adjustment then for the DC offset. So very, very straightforward. You're going to connect your digital multimeter. First of all, and I'll show here the left channel, across the rear speaker terminals. Um, what you're looking to measure here is what is the DC offset from the voltage input stage of the amp. So I've just separated this out. I'll show you the voltage input stage and you can see, and I've referred to this before, these long tail pair. So you can see two transistors, 7251 and 7253, and their emitters are connected together. And what can happen over time is that the gain of the transistors can change and they're not exactly matched. So what you can do here is you can adjust the DC offset preset. Um, what I'm aiming for is approximate, if I can, to get as close to zero millivolts as I can, but providing when you make the adjustment that it's within plus or minus 10 millivolts, that is sufficient. Okay, you know, if you can't achieve zero, don't worry about it, but plus or minus 10 millivolts is within, and it is quite easy to do that. But remember, when you adjust the preset, it will go a positive and a negative voltage. So just take your time on that. What I do before I do any kind of an adjustment, because these amplifiers have been in operation for a long period of time, before I even look to adjust, I'm going to spray directly in some deoxid. And then I'll just rotate the preset backwards and forwards multiple times, but really taking it back to its original point. And then when I then start to do the adjustment, I know that the contact is clean and the wiper of the preset is also clean. So as I make the adjustment, I'm not hitting maybe a part of the carbon track which is dirty or I'm not getting a good connection. So here I was able to do the adjustment then, first of all, for the DC offset. Um, that's both uh, channels, so left and right channel. And then the next thing that I'm showing here is the power output stage. Now I said earlier, if you look from the top of the board, you can see where it says A and A for each channel. And there's a symbol where the preset um, resistors would go in for the adjustment you won't see them okay what's kind of a little bit misleading is that the service manual kind of describes it because it's it's more like a generic type manual for the 8000 series as well all right but don't be put off from that when you look from the top what you're looking to do here is to do the bias adjustment and there's only you know one bias adjustment for each channel so what you're having to do here is you connect and again the manual is slightly misleading it shows emitter resistors which have the leads which come out of the top of the emitter resistors and in theory you could clip onto there 
that is not what is fitted in these amplifiers carefully and if you use some spring connectors connecting to your multimeter you need to go onto the leads of the emitter resistors uh, at the bottom where they connect into the board so just be careful you don't want to short anything out and then once you connect across the emitter resistor what you can then do is adjust the preset potentiometer or preset variable resistor that is shown here now some amplifiers you can make an adjustment and you know within 10 or 15 minutes you just make one or two slight adjustments after that and everything settles down and it's good right for this amplifier it is a powerful amp so you're going to set the volume control at minimum all of your user controls at midpoint um, are just making slight adjustments for this amplifier is a little bit high so you could feel it on the heat sinks even with no operation uh, no audio coming through you could still feel it and it was probably run about 23 millivolts uh, 24 on the other channel so I just make slight adjustments and I can bring it just below probably about 16 millivolts but I just hold it at that point and then what you'll find is as the circuit then starts to uh, you know, be influenced by the adjustment that you've made i.e. more current or less current will start to flow through the output transistors of course that will be reflected of course with the heat sink as well so after about five ten minutes you can feel that the heat sinks then were dropping down to what I would term as normal temperature you know when you touch them they're warm but they shouldn't be hot to touch because it's not you know, it's not working hard at this point and then when I recheck the millivolts I find that it's just maybe dropped slightly or just increased slightly so again I make small adjustments then wait and then after probably half an hour I'm rechecking again and it's a, it's nominal right so it's not going to be bang on 18 millivolts but it could be 18.2 17.8 around that figure and and I've got good stability then now when I was looking at the tone control board and then I also have the speaker selection switch from the front the tone defeat switch I've also cleaning those with deoxid so just fill them up you know with a deoxid spray just leave it a few minutes just to get in there do its work and then really operate those switches multiple times and then once you've done that you know and you've done all of your final adjustment it's a simple matter as with this amplifier just to go through a cleaning process so I just ensure you know that not only is the dust and dirt removed internally but it's also from the outer chassis as well there's just a slight bit of repair work just on the outer case with you know that's common and I just use an enamel based uh, flat black or gloss back uh, enamel it's very very fast dry and I mentioned it on previous tutorials you can buy this stuff and it's it's just absolutely excellent once you put it on you know in less than 10 minutes it's dry rock solid and it's almost an identical match to the original um, paint which was used on these outer cases and things like our cam amplifiers it, it looks almost like to be an identical match so that sort of brings us to the end of this overview tutorial um, if you have any questions of course by all means email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com anytime and I really enjoy the questions that come in like this evening just before I got underway with this repair tutorial I was answering you know a number of different uh, questions for people and these questions come all over the world and I really appreciate that you know it, it has that global reach and I know that when I get the emails back to say, hey, I've repaired my amplifier, you know, it's been a really great experience. There's nothing like repairing a piece of electronic equipment just to give you that buzz. And I've said previously that with audio equipment, it has a different feel to it. It's not like fixing maybe a flat screen TV. You know, with audio, people will keep this technology for literally 30, 40 years or beyond. They just pass it through the family and you can always do that restorative part and bring it back to how it was originally then so i wish you all well and thank you again for stopping by until the next time bye bye